Hey, and welcome to Middle Farm Studios. This is the studio where we recorded the modern and massive drum sample library. And today we're here to look at a mix of a short track that I've done using that sample library. And we're gonna be going through it step by step and looking at all sorts of different techniques that I use for mixing songs in general, as well as how I use modern and massive and how I think you can get the most out of it. The track that we're gonna be looking at today is a short kind of alternative commercial rock song that we've written. And our good friend Robin Adams has put down some amazing vocals on there as well. So we're gonna be looking at this track, it's called For Today, and looking at every aspect of the mix. So as you can see in the session, I've got here an instance of Modern and Massive up and running. And this is the exact setup that I use to create the audio files that I'm gonna use within the mix of the track. Um, so you can see here it's the default Q-Drum Co kit, and I'm also using the VK Copper snare drum, which is the last one on the drop down menu there. Um, I've got it set up so that we can actually monitor what the dry sound out of Modern and Massive was that I used to, the, that I bounced through to audio. And I'm not using any of the turbo functionality or anything like that, I'm just using the raw sound. So I've got um, the kick drum. So let's just take a listen to these raw sounds in the context of an actual beat. Uh, this is what it would sound like. And we're gonna to aim to end up with an actual drum sound once mixed that sounds more like this. Cool, so perhaps the best place for us to start would actually be at the master bus, which might be a little bit counterintuitive. So the way that I approach mixing is to use what's called a top-down approach, which is actually do some processing across the master channel or through a bus that's very far down the uh, through the recording signal chain that then kind of retroactively applies some EQ moves across everything that's running through it. So it's a little bit like getting a little bit of the mastering process done um, while you're mixing and actually before you dive into listening to any of the individual tracks. Um, the EQ I think is one of the most important things that I apply here and, and here I'm, I'm using this uh, Slate Digital Virtual Mix Rack with a couple of instances of two different EQs. So I'm using the Neve style EQ to give a bit of a top end lift. So this is it's kind of like a 5K-ish uh, boost of about 2, 2 dB. I'm also boosting a bit of low end as well. And I'm also high passing here at about 35 Hertz. So those on their own are gonna give me a little bit more bite and presence out of my mix as well as a bit more low end. And then I'm using this custom series EQ to give quite a healthy amount of boost uh, I guess it's like four and a half dB at 12K. And this is a really nice silky sounding top end boost. To me, this is the kind of stuff that you just tend to get when you send tracks off for mastering. Um, so it's really, for me, it makes a lot of sense just to do it at this stage and to always be listening to my sounds running through this. I also have put a little bit of a 60 Hertz bump in on here. That's a bit of a more recent thing I've been doing just to generate a little bit more low end, but it's not necessary. And then finally, I'm using a bit of a trim because the next thing that comes in the uh, signal chain is a compressor. So here I'm using another Slate Digital plugin. This is the FG Grey, which is based on a famous SSL style bus compressor. Um, and the way that I set this is a little bit different to what a lot of people do. A lot of people use their bus compression to get a little bit of extra uh, smack out of the sounds that are running through it, like a little bit of extra attack. I kind of do the opposite. I use a very fast attack and release time here I'm using a 0.3 millisecond attack and the fastest release, a four to one ratio. And what this does essentially is it just clamps down every time there's a snare hit. Uh, the idea here is that you can get the snare to cut through really loud above the rest of the instruments, but it's actually being controlled in level by this, uh, by this compression here so that it doesn't end up kind of jabbing you in the eardrums, which tends to be what happens if you have to mix a snare really loud on top of the rest of the music. So this is a pretty crucial part of my, uh, my mix. I also like very much that this compressor has a high pass filter function, which doesn't affect the actual audio that you hear, but it affects the audio that the compressor is reacting to. And what you can do with that is prevent the kick from setting off too much compression, because if you've got a loud bass heavy kick drum, you're gonna get so much compression on that, it's gonna make the whole mix pump way too much for my liking. So by filtering off that low end at this stage, I'm able to focus the compression more onto the snare. Uh, I'll just show you actually how much this is doing. I'll, I'll play the, the entire mix through the, uh, through the instrumental bus so that you can just see how much gain reduction you're getting. I typically aim for about three or four dB on the snare hits and about 
just about 1 dB on kick. It depends. Sometimes I want a bit more kick pump for effect and I might actually set the high pass filter accordingly, a bit lower down so that you actually get a lot more of that kick pumping effect. And then other mixes, especially some clients don't want to hear any of that and I might push the high pass filter way up so that there's literally nothing happening when the kick hits. It's just getting triggered by the snare. So um, here we go, it's a little excerpt for you to hear and see. If I were to play that exact same thing, but without this, in fact, I'll start without, and then I'll, I'll put it on and you'll hear the difference. You should notice the snare suddenly gets very blocky sounding without it, and it gets uh, way too loud on top of the mix. So the really important thing here is because all of the instrumental channels are going through this. Um, they're all getting affected by the compressor. So although the compressor is taking 4 dB off the snare, I'm, I'm saying, it's actually taking 4 dB off everything. So the relative relationship with the snare to the rest of your mix is kept constant. And that's a really crucial part because otherwise you, there'd be no point in doing this at all. You just mix the snare drum quieter. So essentially we're, we're able to maintain a greater separation of snare drum to the music, but without there being a huge dynamic spike every time. So, you know, that kind of rounds out my top-down mixing. I do, however, um, over here on the actual master bus, have an instance of the Slate Digital Tape Machine, um, which I use set to the half-track mode, and apart from that, pretty much just straight up. And this adds a nice bit of extra low-end girth. Um, again, some clients don't want to hear that, um, but typically I'd say 99% of clients that I work with are totally cool with that being on there, and. When I send my tracks off for mastering, I leave it on there too and never had any complaints. It's quite a subtle change. It's nothing that's really distorting the mix. Um, and then finally, this is something that I would remove if I was gonna send it off for mastering. This is an instance of Fab Filters, excellent Pro-L limiter, which I'm using um, to get my mix up to a kind of commercial-ish volume, perhaps a little bit less than, than what you get from a Pro Master. But this does two things. One, it means that when clients hear what I do, it doesn't sound way softer in volume. But also there's a certain effect you get when you limit and clip your mix where you reduce the, the transient impact again. The snare drum will sound very pokey after the, the treatment that I put it through and the limiting or clipping that gets applied during the master stage tames that down and ends up with a nice fat snare sound. So for me to be able to judge that right so that when I can send my mix off to mastering and know that I'm going to get something back that sounds good, it's really helpful for me to mix through this kind of limiting or clipping um, on the master bus the whole time so I can make all of my decisions based around that. To dive into the way that I set the mixer in Modern and Massive in order to be able to get the sounds that I want out and into audio, um, let's take a look. I'm doing things, I'm, I'm kind of creating an idealized setup really uh, that you couldn't get in real life because what I'm able to do in this program is adjust the relative levels of the various instruments into the room tracks. Now, when you record live drums, you're kind of stuck with cymbals and snare and kick and toms all at their actual levels and cymbals tend to really dominate in room mics a lot of the time and if you want to compress them you end up with loads of extra cymbal in your mix which I don't isn't really the best thing. However what you can do in the virtual domain such as with Modern Massive is actually control the amount of cymbals that goes into your room track. So um, you'll see over here I'm actually not putting any cymbal into the room far microphone. So the room far microphone is going to be essentially just shells. Um, and especially the further you get away from a drum kit when you record it, the more the cymbals tend to carry and you lose the beef off the actual shells. So that's why it's super cool to, to, to use that specific technique on the room far microphone where the shells need all the help they can get. Then I have the room close set. So you've kind of got about, I don't know, I guess you've got a few dB less cymbals than you would normally have. And I'm kind of just comparing the fader here, um, which is set pretty much the same on, on snare. Uh, and toms, and then you can see the symbols have been pulled down a lot. The snare, um, I've, I've trimmed down the snare bottom mic a little bit because I typically don't use very much of that in the mix. Um, something interesting is I've decided just to roll with a single pair of overheads when we recorded Modern and Massive, actually in the room that's right next to me at this moment. We used uh, two pairs of overhead microphones, so we did a pair of large diaphragm condensers and a pair of small diaphragm condensers, which are kind of a much more hi-fi, brilliant sound. 
And I've decided just to roll with the small diaphragm condenser sound for this mix. And I've basically muted the large diaphragm condenser channel on, on all of the uh, on all of the instruments, so the kick, toms, cymbals, none of them have the uh, large diaphragm condenser in there. And they're all bounced through at unity level, so you're getting the kind of as recorded relative volumes of those kit pieces coming through the overheads. Um, and then I've just kind of trimmed the um, like the spot mics on the hats and ride and the, the tom close mics to be something that's usable, gives me loads of gain to work with through in the mix stage. And once I've gone through and exported all of that out, what you end up with is these blue pieces of audio here. So you've got, I've got my kick channel and I summed the kick in and kick sub together uh, for the purposes of this mix. Then you've got the snare top and bottom separated, essentially from there on out, every, every channel separated. So you've got your toms separate, hats ride, overheads, room mono, room close and room far. You could, if you want to get really fancy and for example, bounce, just shells on each of the room tracks and just cymbals on each of the room tracks to be able to have control after the fact of um, of the relative levels of those instruments there instead of having to kind of preset them within the mixer and then print them through to audio. And just to chat for a second about why you would even want to print to audio instead of simply running the MIDI, it's for a few reasons. I think, you know, for example, archival, you want to always be able to reopen a session and have the sounds there and you never know if something gets messed up in your system. It's much better to have it as pure audio there than programs. Um, other reasons could be, I think a big one for me is just mindset. I think when I'm mixing, I don't want to be making what I'd call engineering decisions. When you have the ability of opening up a virtual instrument and being able to try, you know, flick through all the snare drums again or adjust all the levels within there, I feel like sometimes you get a bit further away from the process of actually making what you've already got sound good. So I like it just as a kind of exercise for my own sanity to print things down into audio in order to just work with exactly what I've got in the mix as though these drums have been recorded perhaps even by a client and sent to me instead of it being something which I did myself. So to take a look at the actual MIDI which I programmed for this it's it's kind of a I guess like an alternative slash commercial rock song so we've got quite nice sparse open beats you can see a few things which I've done but I think one of the first things which I want to mention is you'll see that I haven't really programmed anything through the song at full velocity. Now, if you're not familiar with Logic, you'd know if it was at full velocity because you'd see that hit go bright red like that. The color becomes more intense and red, the heavier the hit is going all the way down to this kind of purple here and anything in between. So um, as you look through all of my programming here, you can see while some hits are venturing into the orangey red, none of them are programmed at full velocity. And the reason for that is because it's very rare that a drummer is going to be able to execute a hit at absolutely full strength while they're playing. It's just not something that's very feasible. I mean, you could do it, but then the other argument would be it doesn't sound that good necessarily. Sometimes if you hit the drums too hard, you just get loads of attack and you actually choke the tone out of them. So while we don't go to ridiculous lengths when we sample the drums for GGD, we do capture the very highest velocities that might be used. And that's just not really appropriate for most of the time. So here, you can see I've programmed the bass drummer around. That hit there, which is a heavier one, is about 111, 104. So, you know, the kind of 100 to 110 range, I'd say, is a really usable velocity range for the bass drums in Modern and Massive, where it's still a powerful hit, but it's not choking the drum. And I find that it's actually easier to boost up a bit of extra high end from a slightly softer velocity and get a more rounded sound. It's less kind of pokey and peaky, pokey and peaky. Um, than it is to start with a really high intensity hit that's all attack and try and generate the necessary low end out of that. Uh, snare drum wise, you can see the back beats are programmed at about 112. Um, we've got our ghost notes coming in at about 35. The cymbals, I'm doing some heavier accents on the down beats and then shifting to this kind of alternating uh, between here I've got 104 and 88. So a bit of a swing there to kind of to recreate the molo technique that you'd see drummers using at this kind of tempo. Um, you can see as it gets to the softer verse section of the song, I've dropped the velocities down in general uh, to get a softer sound there. I think it's really important to make sure you adjust the velocities to, to suit the sections because it's hard to mix drums that have been hit really hard to make them sound um, soft and vibey. So I think it's a lot better to start with 
the actual kind of dynamics that the performance would have. And from there, you can find actually you don't need to change a whole lot about your drum mix to get the sounds to not be uh, super pokey and to make sure that the sounds are coherent with the vibe of the section that you're working on. So just to play some examples, and actually here we're going to be we're going to be monitoring the drums which I printed down to audio, but we're still going to be looking at the MIDI here. I'll give you a little bit of a demonstration of this. That's the kind of main part of the beat, and hopefully you can hear there's a natural kind of sway to the cymbals. It's not just this super rigid kind of kind of sound. Um, it's got a bit more of that wash that sounds a lot more realistic. You don't really get drummers playing the way a lot of people program cymbals for this kind of part. Uh, and then to show you the softer section, we've got... Actually, this is something interesting. The hi-hats here, I'm alternating between... I'm kind of varying the velocities quite a lot between 44-ish up to about 91. So. So when we sampled these hi-hats, they actually become hit more with the tip of the stick, the lighter the velocity gets. So if you do kind of alternate between a higher velocity and a lower velocity, it very accurately recreates what a real drummer would do. Um, so it's really important if, you, if you're programming drums like this, if you're programming a, a part like this or hi-hats like this, where you've got long stretches of constant eighth notes, you find there's a lot of mileage to be, to be had by varying the velocities and alternating between a hard velocity and a soft one to get that kind of that realistic feel. And you'll find you don't even really need to move to other articulations of the hi-hats to be able to get that too. So here's a little demonstration. Same deal over here on the ride, you can see I'm, I'm alternating the, the velocity is quite hard. Over here we move on to the ride bell to build us into the fill that's going to take us through to the chorus. Cool, so with an overview of how I've set up Modern and Massive as well as my top-down mixing, should we move on to actually focusing on how I go about mixing these drums? Something else that I've done here to build in a bit of extra human element is I have actually used Logic's humanization feature, which kind of randomly moves the hits around within a certain tolerance. It's set to a very small amount of randomness, but you can see here, for example, um, the two crashes, the hi-hat, pedaled hi-hat, and the bass drum all fall at slightly different times. This could be a lot more exaggerated, you know, for a drummer to play this tight, that would be a, a really great drummer that's then been edited. Um, but that's kind of the sound that I like in my drums, and it's worth experimenting with the humanization in terms of the placement of the hits in order to see um, what kind of more human effects you can get. I, as a general rule, however, feel that it's more important to build in some element of human dynamics and perhaps even um, desirable inconsistency that comes from a human playing an instrument in terms of the dynamics through adjusting the velocities that you use than it is to humanize the playing, uh, to humanize the timing aspect. The timing stuff is cool too, but I think that you'll get a lot more realistic results with drums that are programmed exactly to the grid, but have a decent amount of human ebb and flow in terms of the dynamics um, than you would get if you were to program those same drums with very consistent velocities throughout but with a bit of timing variation built in. I think you'd find the second, the latter, would actually sound less realistic. Uh, so that's my two cents. You might find for your purposes that that isn't the case. So as I move on to mixing the drums, you're gonna see me using this plugin a lot. This is a really exciting new venture for us. This is a plugin called Smash and Grab that we've developed. And essentially, it's based around the concept of having an all-in-one compressor for every type of compression that I use on drums regularly. So you can see over here on this dial that we've got settings for snare, kick, toms, room, overheads, and parallel. And essentially, as you switch that knob around to each setting, the behind the scenes stuff happening within the compressor changes quite dramatically. You've got some fairly different things happening underneath the hood to generate 
exactly the kinds of compression that I love on each of those um, instruments within the drum kit mix. Uh, further to that, we have this great big switch here that goes between smash and grab mode, and you'll notice there's a big GUI change at the same time. Smash is a mode which is derived from your kind of typical FET style compressor. So this is a really fast acting compressor um, that's typically used, for example, on drum rooms or for parallel compression on drums where you want to get a really pumpy um, kind of explosive sound with minimal transient attack. So that's why we're calling it Smash because it's kind of destroying your transients in a, in a pleasant way. Grab does the exact opposite it's going to enhance the attack portion of your drums um, in the kinds of ways that would suit each of these various applications as you turn the drum type dial. Um, in addition to the drum type dial, we've got a few things to mess with. We've got, for example, this normal and extreme setting, which when you toggle in extreme will give you a much more exaggerated compression character without changing any of the other controls. Um, and again, this is all optimized to each of the different drums and changes as you select a different um, drum type on the dial there. We also have a little bit of EQ. We've got a beef and air control. The beef is going to give you a low end boost pre-compression, which can be really good for triggering um, more of that kind of uh, woody smack, for example, on a snare drum. If you can boost more low end into the compression, you can generate a different kind of uh, a less harsh sounding compression character. And then there's the air control, which can give you a really nice glossy, airy boost uh, post-compression. Now, the actual frequency points behind the beef and air controls, again, change depending on the drum type that you select. So, um, so essentially, this plugin could be thought of as basically 12 different compressors, if you count smash and grab, plus each of the drum types. Uh, on top of that, we've also got a saturation mode with three different kinds of saturation. You've got a soft clipping, hard clipping, and a kind of tape emulation which is all there to replicate some of the kind of clipping nature that you get from and the non-linear characteristics that you get from hardware units such as the ones that we modeled here for the GGD compressor. So essentially Smash and Grab is a really flexible compressor for use on drums and actually as we'll see later in the mix it's not even limited to just being used on drums. Um, it's really kind of based on my tastes in drums but actually I think there's plenty of different things that people can adjust here to get exactly the results that they want for their particular sounds. So let's take a look at how I approached mixing the kick drum for this particular song. Uh, there's three elements to the mix chain here. I've got an EQ, compressor, and then some additional saturation. Let's start by looking at the EQ. But what I want to do first is actually show you the raw sound of the kick drum as it was printed out of Modern and Massive. So here's how it sounds just straight from the program. After I, I apply the EQ moves, which I went for, this is what it sounds like. So as you can see, just looking visually at this EQ graph here, I've gone for entirely what's called subtractive EQ. Now there's no right or wrong ways to do things, but just some people gravitate more towards enhancing the characters that they like in what they hear and other people gravitate towards reducing the sounds that they dislike. Um, I kind of, I mean, there's no hard and fast rule. People kind of change which way they do it all the time. And within a mix, you might think of different instruments in different ways, and you might use a combination of boosting or cutting on any one instrument too. But for this particular mix, I thought actually, let's do it as much as possible with subtractive EQ, because that's the way I've been going with my own mixes recently, and I've been really pleased with the results. So. Um, the main points which I'm looking at is the kick drum has quite a lot of extra low end um, when you hear it in its raw form now. Like I say, you could boost in loads of extra top end to compensate for that, but I think it's a bit more effective actually to cut low end. So um, here I'm cutting like nearly 8 dB, about 110 hertz. Then I'm cutting some of the kind of boxy mid range around 300 hertz, which is gonna focus the low end into a, a kind of smaller space. Um, and give us a more just focused and tight, but still big low end. And then cutting a little bit at the kind of one and a half K mark that's gonna give you a bit more clack. Now, on smaller kick drums, it can actually be really nice to enhance this frequency area, but the particular kick drum that we recorded here is a beautiful uh, 24 inch bass drum made out of steel, and it's got loads of those frequencies in it to begin with. So actually, if anything, it can, can have a bit of that tamed. And then finally, I'm cutting a little bit of the um, 
the clickier parts of the sound with a 7K cut and also a low pass filter at 13K. Now this is partly uh, genre specific. If I was working in metal, I'd probably leave more of those frequencies in. However, for something that's a bit more rock and with slower kick drum patterns, I'm allowing there to be not quite as much top end air as I might otherwise uh, keep in a kick drum sound for heavier styles. Uh, apart from that, I'm also high passing the bass drum at a very low 21 hertz, which is probably doing next to nothing actually. <laughs> um, so let's just take a listen once more to before and after. I'll pop it off and then back on again. So you can see, if anything, it gets really scooped. You can hear the mid-range drop away, but this is gonna really suit us very well in the mix. Moving on from the EQ, um, I'm gonna move on to compression. And what I've got here is I'm understandably using the kick mode in Smash and Grab. I'm using in grab mode, because what I wanna try and do here is get a slightly exaggerated attack that's gonna give this kick drum uh, a lot more impact. Uh, I'm using a tiny bit of the beef to add a tiny bit of extra low end to the to the kick drum having just cut some. Um, but something that's really important is I'm not using this on full mix. So if you compress a bass drum in grab mode like this or with any slow attack, fast release compression, you're gonna find that you actually reduce the amount of low end resonance of the drum. Maybe the, the impact of the drum is still gonna have loads of low end, but that low end isn't gonna hang around for very long. It's gonna be a very short burst of bass frequencies and that perhaps isn't gonna give you the nice bloom of low end that you want under your bass drum. This is where the mix knob can come in handy because essentially by blending in some of the dry signal, um, you get back some of that low end bloom. And if you judge it just right, you end up with kind of a nice balance of the squishy enhanced attack of the kick drum through the compression mixed with the original kind of bloom that you're getting from the non-compressed bass drums. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna play you the raw bass drum, then engage the compressor with the mix set at 100%, which as I mentioned is gonna cut a little bit of low end at the same time as exaggerating the attack. Then I'll roll back the mix knob to the kind of area where I think it sounds good and gives you back a bit of the low end that you might want. So hopefully you can hear what I'm hearing, which is that we're getting a little bit of more exaggerated attack on the bass drum. Uh, it's that kind of nice squishy character. I don't know how better to describe it than that, that for me, I really like. I guess wet would be another word for it. Um, but at the same time, yeah, you're still getting the bass frequencies ringing on nicely, which is gonna give us a nice big sound under the mix. Finally, I'm using a little bit of tape saturation, courtesy of Slate Digital's tape. Um, this time I'm set to the 15 ips mode and the half track tape. And this gives you a natural low end bump. And I find that the 15 ips um, in comparison with the 30 ips speed uh, also gives you a bit of a kind of upper mid range emphasis and cuts a little bit of top end. And then for me, it just gives you a slightly more angry sound, which I really like. This is a plugin that I use basically on every mix on my kick drum. So first I'll start with the bypass. I'm actually pushing it a little bit and you'll hear on the harder hits, you just get that little kind of saturation coming through. I wouldn't do this on a metal mix or a mix that I wanted to sound quite clean. But for, again, for this kind of rock vibe, I think it's just about perfect. So, so what I'll do now is I'll show you how the bass drum sounds with no processing and then I'll whack the processing on and you can hear the before and after. So you can hear it's a lot more appropriate. You can hear more of the beta attack and the low end is just nowhere near as overbearing. It's not setting off that master bus compression um, in the kind of way that's gonna lead to uh, too much pumping in the mix as it was sounding before I applied the plugins. So moving on to snare drum, uh, there's a few different things that I'm doing here. So I'm gonna start with the snare top microphone. 
Uh, the first thing which I'm going to do actually is I'm going to distort it a little bit because this uh, snare top signal that we recorded in Modern and Massive has loads of attack to it, which I love. But for this particular style, I want a bit of a kind of fatter sound. And by distorting the transient, I'm going to just kill a little bit of that instant pop that you get on the front end of the note. For this, I'm going to use a model of a uh, Neve 1073 preamp, which Slate Digital have created. And I'm going to push the drive up until you're seeing that red light coming on. So. talking about something really subtle here, um, but it's just enough to just knock off a little bit of the harshness of the attack. Um, next up, I found a couple of the um, frequencies that are ringing on in the snare drum um, that I didn't particularly like. There's kind of an awkward mid-range ring to it. It's got a short sound, this snare drum, but still I felt like it could be uh, tamed a little bit by finding these specific notch frequencies and cutting them. So actually what I'll do while I'm playing it back is I'll, I'll turn these into boosts so you can specifically hear what I was, uh, what I was cutting. And uh, then I'll turn them back into cuts again and you can hear how much cleaner the snare sound becomes. So starting with a 290 hertz boost. So you can see that's, that's neatened up that kind of lower fundamental tone that's ringing through. And then we'll check out this 415 hertz one, which for me is a bit of this kind of wheezy frequency almost. It doesn't sound, uh, doesn't sound all that pleasant to my ears. Now I'm not trying to completely eliminate these sounds, I'm just trying to reduce them somewhat so that uh, they're not so overbearing once you hear them in the context of the mix. So that's what I've done to the snare top. Uh, listening to the snare bottom channel here, I thought it's nice just to cut a little bit of the kind of, um, I don't even know what to describe this 6K region as, but there's just something a little bit ratty sounding in there, I guess. So again, I'll play the snare bottom signal uh, with that turned off and then engage it. just makes it sound a little bit more neutral and transparent to my ears. And for me, that's the sound now that I can blend a little bit louder with the snare top mic to get the sound that I like. Now, that's the extent of the processing that I've done on the top and bottom channels separately. What I then do is I send them through a bus where I process both the top and the bottom together to arrive at my final snare sound. So when you're working with live tracked drums, often what you have to do is gate the snare drum close mics quite heavily because you get so much cymbal and particularly hi-hat coming through there. And with the amount of processing that you typically have to do to a snare close mic signal, you end up exaggerating some really horrible frequencies in that bleed from the, uh, from the other kit pieces. And the end result can be really awkward sounding. So um, while we don't necessarily need to do that here, now there is a little bit of bleed printed into these channels uh, by choice, because that is one of the things which you can do within Modern and Massive. And I feel it does help get a little bit of extra realism. It's not printed at the actual volume that you typically get bleed through on a live track. It's a lot softer than that. So why would I want to gate this signal? The main reason would be actually because I want to shorten the length of the snare sound in the close mics. And you really, to get the kind of snare sound that I want, it's all about having quite a short blast coming from the close mics. And then a lot of the body will get filled in through the overheads, the reverbs, and especially the room mics. And that's what's going to give the snare a lovely decay that's going to keep it at the front of the mix. So too much resonance in the snare close mic I find can be a little bit difficult to control. And it tends to contain exactly those kinds of overtones that I was notching out a second ago when I was working on the snare top mic. So here I've got a gate. I guess you'd actually call this an expander because I'm not cutting to silence between the hits. I'm, I'm cutting 13 dB between hits. And this gate is fabulous, by the way. It's made by um, Fab Filter and it's called Pro G. And I've got it set with quite a fast release time of 200 milliseconds or so, and just fastest attack, knee, hold, and, uh, and a little bit of look ahead here, just a tiny bit, half a millisecond or so, just so that the front end of the note doesn't get clipped off. Um, so let's take a little listen to what that does to our snare channel. <laughs> 
So as you can hear, that's a pretty drastic difference. That really tightens up the snare drum sound and cuts a lot of the bleed out. The next part of our signal chain is going to be some EQ. And very similarly to the bass drum, what we've done here is focused almost exclusively on subtractive EQ. Um, when I'm EQing a snare drum, and I, I use this EQ typically, FabFilters Pro Q2, because it has a great visualization feature. When the, when the track is playing, you can see the kind of mountain range of frequencies that, uh, that are being registered by the snare drum. And what I essentially do is I try and paint that, that uh, spectrum of frequencies into a slightly smiley face graph. This sounds so um, abstract and not related to audio, but just through years of analyzing my favorite snare drum sounds, I found that something they all have in common is they have this similar kind of shape when registered on a frequency response graph. Um, so I want to see a healthy bump around the fundamental frequency, which is typically between, I guess, 180 for quite a low tuned snare, all the way up to like 250 or, or higher for a high tuned snare. Um, I want to see quite a healthy amount there, and then I want to see a bit of a reduction through the mid range, typically looking at the kind of 400 hertz area, maybe three to five, let's say, let's bracket three to 500 hertz as a potential range for kind of awkward mud in your, in your snare drum sound. And then I find that typically between about 800 to one and a half K, there's quite a lot of harsh frequencies there, as well as some higher overtones that can sound just a bit clanky and unpleasant in the mix. Then finally, I, I tend to find that kind of around the three to four K region, there can be quite a harsh stick attack. Um, how much of that you leave in is very much down to personal taste. It's also what's suitable for the genre. And for me, also a big part of how much you leave in there is gonna come down to the compression that you use and how much compression that you use on your snare drum, because if you exaggerate the attack portion of the snare drum a lot and you leave a lot of those kind of three, 4K frequencies in, you're gonna get a very harsh snare sound. However, if you don't compress the snare or perhaps if you compress the snare with a very fast attack to actually cut the transient information out, you can leave a little bit more of those frequencies in without them jabbing you in the ear as much. So let's just take a look at the, uh, the graph that's made by this snare drum post EQ and hopefully you'll see what I mean about this kind of low frequency bump bit of a kind of scoop, smiley face, back up to a similar peak in the top end. Note that I'm also uh, high passing at about 80 hertz and low passing about 15K. I'm actually using this low pass, it's slightly resonant, it's actually boosting a little bit of frequencies just below it to give us a little bit of extra air into our snare sound. So I'll hit play and you can actually see what it looks like on this graph. So this particular snare actually has probably a bit more low end than I typically leave in my snare drums, but um, I'm cool with it. For rock, perhaps that's appropriate. For metal, it might sound a little bit muddy, especially on really fast stuff. But on this, I don't mind there being a, a deeper kind of character to the snare drum. But despite there being quite a large peak over to the left-hand side here, um, I think you would still have noticed that you've got this kind of gradual smiley face character going on through the rest of the frequency range. So that's my snare drum EQ for this particular mix. The final piece of the puzzle on the close mic is uh, another instance of our smash and grab compressor. Here I've got it set to snare and um, I'm actually driving the input and output section a little bit which is going to generate a bit of extra saturation because this compressor does have some elements of analog modeling in it including you know, input and output saturation. So by driving the input a bit harder again we take a little bit of the peak off the drum which for me is going to get us closer to that kind of fat rock sound. Um, I'm using a little bit of the air control over here, only 1.8 dB, but it's quite powerful. And that's gonna bring out a little bit more sizzle in our snare drum sound. Um, I'm using the tape style saturation. I think yeah, I'm even giving it just a tiny bit of saturation on the knob there. And uh, the aim here is to balance the extra attack and aggression that we're getting through the compression character with the saturation character that we get from the compressor and uh, essentially to generate a very hard transient and then soften it a little bit through saturation. Typically for this kind of thing, I'm, I'm compressing quite hard. I'll, I'll expect to see the needle hitting about minus 10 dB on, on backbeat hits anyway. Let's hit play and see what it does. 
So if anything, I actually just increase the amount of compression there a little bit. You could hear as I turn the threshold way down, the snare just becomes a blip, basically. It's not that unlike gating a snare drum, actually, when you push it that hard. So there's also a balance to be struck between the noise gate, if you're using one, as I am on this mix, and the compressor. And you don't want to gate really hard and then compress really hard because there'll be nothing but a very short bit at the front of your snare. Um, and we do want to retain a little bit of body there. So that's my snare compression here. However, while that EQ compression and gating that I just applied to the snare drum was on that snare drum close channel, there's a couple more steps. And one of them, which affects all of the drums in my drum mix, but particularly the snare drum, is a technique called parallel compression, which is I'm sending my um, various drum channels, once I've put them through my desired mix, to a compressor which is kept aside from the main part of the signal, it's in parallel with it. So what I'm doing is I'm sending a signal from each of the close mic and overheads and room buses to a separate compressor which is kept in parallel. It's not in the main signal chain, it's uh, an insert into the signal chain that then gets blended in underneath the, uh, the main mix. And what I'm aiming to achieve here is I'm actually trying to get a very thick, um, so what I'm actually trying to get here is an extremely compressed um, kind of pumping compression with very little transient information left into it. And having that in parallel with the main mix is going to essentially kind of fill out the spaces between the hits. As the hit subsides, you're gonna get this compressor releasing and you're gonna hear all sorts of uh, the kind of kit noise. You're gonna hear the room mics coming up. You're gonna hear the resonance of the drums all expanding up to fill that space that's left. Uh, if I put this directly onto the drum chain signal, uh, if it was in series with the rest of the, the drum processing, it would be way too extreme. However, being able to keep things in parallel in this form is going to uh, allow us to keep control of it. Now, I don't send equal amounts of every kit aspect to this parallel compression. Um, what I do send more than anything is snare drum, and for that reason, it gets affected the most. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, bypass the parallel compression and play the snare drum and then put it back on again. Uh, over here, you'll see the settings that I'm using. I'm using this smash mode. I'm using it on the specific parallel drum type. I'm saturating quite heavily. Um, I'm using quite a high ratio and I'm not really touching the beef and air controls. I'm using a lot of threshold to just completely crush the, the, the mix here. So uh, here's the snare drum on its own and then I'm gonna pop on the bus, uh, which is this one down here, bus 21. So you can hear that is a gigantic difference. And it's probably more than I do on most of my mixes. I, if anything, I'm exaggerating it a little bit here so that you can hear it very clearly. But um, the sound of this parallel compression is going to greatly increase the length of the snare drum in the mix. And it's just a crucial part of my drum mix in general. We're gonna come back to the parallel compression a little bit later and I'll show you how it sounds with the whole mix running through it um, in context too, because I feel like that's where you really hear it the most. Finally, I have a bit of reverb. And again, I'm using something a little bit different to my normal. I'm using this great reverb from Valhalla DSP. It's called Room. Um, and I'm also running it through a bit of compression and EQ to give it a slightly more explosive character um, and also cut a lot of low end. You can see over here on the EQ, I'm high passing it. Well, I wasn't, but now I'm gonna high pass it all the way up, uh, further reducing low end at around 220 hertz, boosting in a little bit of kind of um, of 1K-ish for a bit more aggression and also a little bit of top end shelf too. So here's what the snare with the reverb and parallel compression sounds like. It's worth mentioning that with uh, drum reverb, I'm not really looking for a realistic space. Uh, one of the reasons that we choose to record drums in amazing sounding acoustic spaces, such as the Middle Farm Live Room next to me now, where we recorded Modern and Massive, um, is because that kind of realistic ambience, I don't think can really be substituted for anything else. It's just, it's absolutely necessary if you want great um, realistic room ambience to just do it the hard way and actually record in a room of that, of that type. So 
you know, in modern and massive, we have this fantastic sounding live room at, at our disposal. So what I'm trying to achieve with this reverb sound actually is just a kind of um, slightly dingy, zingy, industrial sounding verb that's not really realistic, but it's something that's gonna give a bit of extra length and also width to the snare sound because it's quite a wide stereo effect. You can kind of hear the, the snare tail disappearing off to the sides and that's a really desirable sound as far as I'm concerned. So moving on to toms and with, I guess, toms being one of the least hit pieces on a kit, uh, at least for this kind of music anyway, um, there's actually not even that many instances to choose from to, to dive in and, and look into mixing them. Let's look at this little fill that comes between the verse and the chorus. Uh, that uses the rack tom and the second floor tom. And we'll use this as kind of the basis for, for seeing how I, how I process tom. So I'll just play the, the fill for a second just to get us situated. So with toms, I'm kind of looking for a similar thing that I look for in uh, bass drum and in snare, which again is this kind of big smiley face EQ curve, um, as in that's what I, I look to see on, um, on a frequency analyzer post EQ. So typically when you see a tom um, un-EQ'd, and these are the EQ settings here that I used on the rack tom, um, you're gonna get a lot of note clustered around the fundamental tone of the drum, then you're gonna get a lot of mud kind of immediately above it in the frequency range. Um, you're probably gonna get some mid range that kind of has that kind of gulpy uh, back of the mouth kind of, I don't know how better to describe it than that, but that kind of really boxy mid range character that, that sits a bit higher up in your kind of 700 to 1K range. And then you're probably gonna find that you have to bring out a bit of extra attack and sometimes shape where the attack is focused. The Q Drumco kit that we used here in the Modern and Massive session had coated drum heads on it, which kind of instantly shifts the presence peak down a little bit from, from a clear head. A clear head tends to have like quite a, a plasticky sounding kind of airiness to it, while a coated head tends to sound more rolled off. And you can kind of see up here that I'm cutting a bit of 5K, which I guess it would be where you get the presence peak on a, on a coated head and instead then boosting in a bit of like 10K, which is, I mean, I'm not saying this is, this is a hard and fast rule, but trying to give it a bit more of that kind of clear head vibe. Um, I think that coated heads sound great, and I think it's an entirely a great choice for this, this song here. I just wanted to bring out a little bit more clarity up there. So you can see here my moves are, I've got a high pass filter, I've got a cut kind of on where I could perceive the, the tone of the drum, like the actual note just because it's such an overwhelming amount of frequency uh, centered around there. I still want to hear the note, it just needs to be controlled a little bit. Then I've got a bit of a cut, quite a large cut here, 10 dB at 350 hertz, that's that mud region I'm talking about, about 8 dB around 1K. Um, as I mentioned, that's kind of your boxy, kind of uh, just just ugly sounding um, frequencies to have on, on, on toms. So let's just take a little listen to the rack tom, and I'm gonna keep it soloed here and you can see how the frequency response is going to look um, through the, the frequency analyzer of the plugin. So you can see that initial impulse of top end almost kind of balances out in level with the, the fundamental tone over to the left hand side of the frequency analyzer, but it does die off a lot more quickly and that's kind of what you expect with a tom, it's that note that stays ringing on. Um, with this being a 13 inch tom, it's got quite a deep note to it. So even though technically it's a rack tom, you're starting to approach the realm of a floor tom in, in terms of the tone anyway. Um, I use a very similar principle on the floor toms, on all kinds of toms really, but the frequency points are gonna have to move. I mean, typically the, well, always the fundamental tone is gonna move down on a lower tuned tom. So typically as you go to a bigger, a bigger sized tom, and then generally your kind of mid range um, mud cut and your kind of boxiness cut are going to move down a little bit too as the drum increases in diameter. But the presence peak aspect is really dependent on a lot of factors like the microphone positioning and well I mean all of these things are dependent on the microphone positioning but just don't be afraid to um, to use quite different looking EQ curves on the different toms of the same kit. Um, if the resulting frequency um, landscape looks very similar, you'll find that the drums all tie together nicely. Something that I always want to hear in my mixes when drummers use uh, 
the kick drum in between the toms when you hear really fast fills between the hands and feet. I want them to kind of, I want the toms to have a tone to them, but I love that effect of the attack sounding quite similar on the toms and the bass drum so that when they're played in quick succession, you get just this really consistent sounding attack between those instruments. So um, this is where, again, the frequency analyzer really comes into, into its own because you, um, you can really dial in where the attack is uh, which you can do by ear, it's just a lot more difficult to do consistently between instruments like that. Um, and you can just get um, fills that really sound very consistent between all the drums and that. So it's kind of like a really thrilling sound when you hear a drummer playing a really fast fill and it just sounds like, almost like they're playing an entire kit of kick drums, but some of them have like much more sustain than toms. Um, so that's kind of my ethos to toms. Let's just take a, a little cursory look at the EQs which I've applied to the floor toms. You can see a similar deal here. On this one, I think I've probably used the high pass filter to tame down some of that low end bump. Um, plus, of course, the low end, the fundamental tone of this 16 inch tom is getting really quite far down and probably the microphone is not quite as efficient as picking it up as it is on the, um, on the rack tom. So it might not need as much uh, cutting of low end there. But similarly, 250 hertz I'm cutting. Uh, 700 hertz and I'm cutting a bit of that same kind of 5k region. This one didn't seem to need any extra uh, airy boost on top and then on floor tom too. Yeah look I've gone for a really huge cut here and this time it's closer to 200 while this one's about 650 on the 18 inch tom. So I guess you know what I'm saying holds true. You can see that these these mid cuts are shifting down as the tone of the drum shifts down and then typically up here you've got your kind of 5k cut there. So to then move on to the tom bus I've got three things going on in the actual bus which these um, individual Tom Close mics are feeding to. The first thing I've got here is a limiter and I'm using the classic old Waves L1 limiter here. Uh, kind of similarly to the snare, I'm trying to shave off a bit of transient in order to get um, kind of fat rock sound. I want to be able to hear the tone of the toms and if the attack is too prominent above the tone, like if the actual transient's too spiky, it's really difficult to find a level for the toms where they don't jump out at you too much, but you can also hear the tone of the drum. Because if there's a really huge transient, you try and turn them up loads to hear the note and the attack is just out of control. So this is where a limiter can really come into handy. And I'm not using it to increase volume, I'm just using it to, to lop off a transient. So, I mean, I'll just hit play and we'll see how much gain reduction I'm getting here between the two toms. So you can see the rack one was getting what, about 3 dB and the floor two was getting over 6 dB. This also adds a consistency to the sound. So when you hear a drummer play a really fast fill um, or just play through the toms in general, this limiter is going to ensure that the peaks of the attacks are very consistent. Even if perhaps the hits are not 100% consistent, this limiter is going to help make it sound like every hit was hit um, very evenly. Next up, I'm using a little bit of uh, the SPL Transient Designer to cut sustain here. Now, it's great to have long sustaining toms, you know, when you tune a really resonant tom to sound great, it's typically going to have a really long note to it. Um, however, in the mix, sometimes that note can be a bit too much, especially on the floor toms, they can kind of overwhelm the mix if they hang around for too long. So I like to use a transient designer to, to kind of reduce the level of that sustain. Um, you're still going to hear some of that initial impulse of low end coming through. Um, right after the transient, but then this is going to kind of cut it off a little bit, make it sound almost like you put a, a noise gate on it, I suppose, uh, without losing any hits if they don't cross the threshold of a noise gate. So, you know, this is a bit of a better solution as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'll just show you what this sounds like. I'll play that same fill and I'll, I'll kind of, I'll turn up the sustain and then cut it again so you can hear the difference. <laughs> So for me, that's just uh, giving it a bit more of that kind of, I guess it's a bit more rock that way. It's, it's funny when it comes to heavy drums, so much of getting the, the desired sound is about adding attack and then taking it away and then adding it again. It's kind of funny. It's just a strange process that, that I guess we've evolved to like hearing on rock recordings. And uh, sometimes it takes these slightly kind of bizarre long-winded routes to get there. But um, this particular thing I, th I think works really well, especially for neatening up the low end in your mix. Uh, you just have to treat it with care. If you cut too much sustain, then you're not gonna hear the note of the drum like I was talking about earlier with the limiter.
Finally, I'm using our um, GGD smash and grab comp here on Tom's mode, as you'd expect. And I've got it on smash, and I'm doing this again to further trim down the transient a little bit more. So um, this is another bit of bit of work that I'm doing here to um, to reduce the initial transient spike. And I'm also using the mix knob here, so I've got it set to fairly heavy compression, and I'm using the mix knob to dial back the effect of that compression in order that it doesn't sound too extreme. Um, I'm going to make this loop a little bit longer just so it's not really annoying. Um, here we go, this is the toms soloed and I'll, I'll keep this bypass and then engage it. Now even though the attack is really quick in smash mode, there's still just a tiny bit of transient flap that gets through which sounds really good on toms um, as far as I'm concerned. So. I really love using that GGD comp on, on the Tom bus, on that Tom setting. And like I mentioned, you know, that is quite a different thing happening under the hood than you get with the other modes. Uh, I'm also running this into the parallel compression, although at a much lower quantity than I ran the snare drum. And I'm also running it into the reverb too. And that just about uh, finishes it up for Toms. They don't take as much work, i found, as long as they're well recorded. I think Toms are one of those things where if if they weren't tuned really well, then you're going to be fighting them. But thankfully here, you know, you've got some really great tuned drums in this in this sample library. And I think the toms are one of those things where if, if it's not a really good sounding drum that's been tuned well, it's almost impossible to salvage in the mix. But thankfully, these are really great sounding drums from QDramco. Uh, moving on to cymbals. So I'm using cymbals to denote uh, the overheads, but also the spot mics. Now, some people like to give really different treatment to the spot mics that are close up on the smaller cymbals in the kit. Um, I tend to like to just treat them all at the same time, just kind of find a general blend that works. You can see here, just in terms of level, I've got my hi-hat mic turned way down. I'm not really using very much of that at all. The ride's a little bit more prominent, and if any of you have recorded live drums, you'll know that the rides, although they're quite loud in person, tend not to cut through into the overheads anywhere near as much as the crash cymbals and, and uh, hi-hats that you, you hear next to them. So the ride cymbal typically needs a little bit more help in the spot mics. Uh, and then I have the overheads channel here. So really when I'm thinking about overheads, I'm not trying to generate a lot of extra kind of beef for the close mics. Some people love to do that. Some people leave a lot of extra low end in the overheads and they kind of mix with the approach of starting with the overheads and filling in the close mics. And that's cool and it works for plenty of people. Uh, but for me, I prefer my overheads and, and my close mics on the cymbals to be more of like a, a cymbal mic uh, situation. Whereas the room mics perhaps are gonna give me more of the, the body of the actual shells too. So uh, in terms of processing on the, on the overheads, you can see I've jogged a huge uh, high pass filter up to 180 Hertz here. Um, I've also cut a little bit around 500 that I guess sounded a bit boxy. This is the big one though. I think there's always an issue somewhere between about five to seven K with um, with crash cymbals in particular. They tend to have this huge, great big spike there that sounds very abrasive. Um, actually, perhaps the best thing I can do is I'll, I'll bypass that and I'll, I'll hit play on the overhead channel because this song is riding on the crash. You're gonna hear it straight away. And you're gonna see on the spectrum analyzer a great big hump occurring exactly where I've cut here. So. Uh, let's just take a quick listen to this overhead channel, which has the high pass filter and low pass filter on it, but uh, doesn't have this kind of uh, 6K cut there. So that's a really drastic change that you get when you engage uh, this EQ here. So I've got a big bell cut of 8 dB at 6K and that immediately sucks away all of those very harsh sounding frequencies. I mean, um, for me, getting overheads right is all about that. Getting, getting the cymbals to sound right is all about that particular move. You know, you can mess with your high and low pass filters and other cuts, but if you don't find where the, the crash cymbals in particular are ringing out most harshly and cut there, it's gonna be really difficult to make your cymbals sound good in the mix, in my experience. So that's my EQ that I'm using on, on the cymbals. However, I am also notching out a particular ringing frequency in the crash, I think it was. If I, if I, if I leave this flat and then cut it, you'll hear, um, you'll hear just how much it's doing. So again, I'll hit play. 
um, with this on and then I'll unbypass it and you'll suddenly hear this kind of whistling frequency appear in the overheads. You could drive yourself crazy finding every single frequency that needs notching and, and notching it out and end up with perhaps a slightly kind of uh, neutered sounding cymbal sound for your record. Uh, for me, I think that it's important just to focus in on the one or two that are most abrasive and cut those. So here, that was that particular frequency that, that I found um, to be abrasive. And it's a bit of a skill that you need to develop to be able to hear that, um, you know, to listen to cymbals and be able to, peek out, to pick out those frequency peaks that are ringing out above the others. Um, but once you've done it a few times, it's, it's kind of fun. It's almost like a game, I suppose. So having dealt with the EQ on the cymbals channel, we then move on to a bit of compression. And here I'm using this trusty uh, smash and grab compressor set to smash mode with the overhead drum type on the dial. Um, the smash mode, as we've said a few times, is gonna kill some transient information. And if you hear the overhead channel without the compressor, you'll notice especially the snare is peaking very loudly. And um, I mean, that's not the end of the world, but like I mentioned, I particularly want the overhead channels to be like a cymbal mic. And I don't want to be drastically changing the snare sound as I adjust the level of the overhead mic. So for me, it works well to, um, to kind of compress the cymbals anyway to get a bit of extra length out of them, but also to tame the transients off the snare and sometimes the toms too. I'm also taking advantage of the air control here, just a little bit, one and a half dB, um, to give back a little bit of the sheen that we all have lost through the low pass filter that I think I had set about 15k um, earlier on in the signal chain. So by cutting that and then boosting it back with this very nice airy sounding EQ, just to give a more consistent shimmer to the cymbal sound, but you have to be really careful. These are very powerful controls. And finally, I'm not actually running this at 100% mix. Um, that can be a bit too aggressive sounding for me. And as you'll see when we move on to the room mics, there's plenty of compression happening there. So this is more about maintaining a really nice consistent vibe um, to the overhead channel. So I'll, I'll first play it bypass, then I'll engage it with 100% mix, and then I'll roll back the mix so you can hear it that way. The big place where you can hear its effect, I think, apart from on the snare drum, is on the initial attack of that, that crash cymbal, which sounds a lot smoother with the compression there. And that makes it more of a kind of wash that will sit into the mix. Uh, finally, I am also sending a little bit of it to the parallel drum compression channel as well. The reason for that is because I do want all of the kit elements to interact with that compressor and the snare drum in particular um, in the parallel compression chain. So I don't leave anything out of it, but I'm not sending anywhere near as much cymbal as I am snare drum, for example. So when it comes to the room mics, I'm not doing very much at all on the individual channels. Um, I am just applying a little bit, well, I'm high pass filtering and also cutting a little bit of presence out of the room mono mic that's quite trashy sounding, as well as a little bit of compression from the smash mode of the, uh, the GGD smash and grab comp. But most of the heavy lifting here is happening on the room bus. So in terms of EQ, I'm cutting quite a lot of low end here. There's a ton of kick drum coming through in the rooms and it's just not really necessary as far as I'm concerned. So I'm, I'm cutting quite a lot of that away. I've got a 120 hertz high pass, but I've, I've turned the cue down quite a lot. So you're seeing it's quite a soft roll off that's reaching really high up into the spectrum. Then giving it a bit of extra aggression around 1.5K. Uh, cutting again, kind of where the cymbals sound really harsh, but then giving it a bit of a kind of glassy sheen up on top. So. So here's the sound of the room mics summed together. Now the most important element in the room mics for me is the snare drum. Uh, what I want to hear above all else is the snare drum kind of explosion expanding into the room. Uh, because it's going to be such a crucial part of getting the snare to sound the way that I want it to sound in the end. For me, rock drums have to have that explosive character with loads of ambience, and uh, there's just no substitute for a great sounding drum room on, on snare as far as I'm concerned. So the snare drum is the most important thing. I'm not afraid to shelve away frequencies that are um, perhaps making the cymbals dominate too much. Uh, 
I'm not afraid to get rid of some low end, although you'll notice there's still plenty of kick drum in there. Um, and also I've found that this kind of boost around 1.5k with this particular miking setup that we used is a pleasant place to bring out a bit more aggression in the shells without making the cymbals sound too crazy. Uh, however, next up I am notching the same frequency that I notched in our overhead channel, which is 2750 hertz. Again, that cymbal whistle coming from the crash uh, is going to be coming through in those room mics too. So generally any notches that I apply to the overheads, I'll apply as well to the room channels. Next up, we've got our good old GGD comp again, this time set to rooms and on smash mode as before. Now, as I've been saying, I really want the snare to cut through loads, but I also want to compress the room mics a little bit to get a bit more of that kind of pumpy character going on. And as I do that, I'm gradually going to reduce the peaks of the snare drums above all else, which um, kind of counteracts what I'm trying to achieve in the end. So a bit like how we have to play with the, the attack quite a lot with the snare drums and toms in particular here, there's kind of um, a little bit of give and take. So first of all, I'm going to compress the rooms quite a lot to get that really thick kind of glued together room sound. And then what I use is quite a nifty trick uh, using this same gate, but set to upward expansion mode. What that's going to mean is uh, it actually, instead of making things quieter when they pass the threshold, makes things louder. And here I'm particularly feeding the snare top channel into the side chain. So basically every time the snare hits, it makes the room mics jump up in volume for a certain length of time. In other words, I get back that headroom, that snare kind of poking out above the rest of the kit. Now obviously when it does this, it is also raising the level of the cymbals and everything else that's in the room mics, but in general the effect seems to kind of trick the ear into feeling like there's just a lot more snare volume above all else. So um, these two things work together. So what I'm going to do is first of all start with no compression, engage the compression, and you'll hear how the snare kind of really sits back into the rest of the drum sound and they'll engage our uh, upward expansion on the room channel and you'll see how the snare suddenly starts jumping out to the front again. So for me, this, this trick, I guess you'd call it, is such a crucial part to getting room mics to sound the way I want to and to getting my snare drum to sound the way I want it to sound on a, in a drum mix because there's just no other way I've found of getting that same clarity of the snare in the room mics while also getting that really aggressively compressed vibe too. Um, and you'll hear once the whole mix is put together that the snare has this immediate kind of mid-rangey stereo spread to it, which is coming from those room mics there. Uh, it's just a great sound. And again, the, the room here at Middle Farm is just so fantastic. So uh, it's amazing to have it at our disposal here in this program. So the much lower dynamic of the verse sections is mirrored in the programming. You know, the drums are not being hit as hard. However, there's still a few things that uh, I wanted to do to the drum sound differently during the verse sections in order that it didn't sound quite as, uh, quite as explosive, I guess, because Without the wall of heavy distorted guitars going on that you've got in the intro and chorus, you don't need as much in the way of the drum room in order for it to be audible. You don't have to crank the level of the drum room to anywhere near the same degree. And also, you don't need quite as much of the close mics to be cutting through either. So this is quite a typical thing that I'll do in softer sections in songs. I'll typically leave the overheads as they were, but I'll bring back the volume of the kick drum, the snare, the toms if they're being used in that section but mainly I'll bring back the volume of the rooms quite significantly too. So I'm just going to pop this into automation mode here and you can see the moves which I've made. So this is my kick drum here, it's dropped about 2 dB, 1.5 dB anyway. Um, the snare, uh, I dropped it about a dB and a half, but I also dropped the amount of it going to the parallel compression by about 5 dB, 4.5 dB, and I reduced the amount of reverb there. So. So what happens is you go into the verse section is it just gets a lot more intimate without the massively explosive sounding room mics, you know, being cranked there. The whole thing gets stripped back and it sounds just a little bit more close and up front, but not in an aggressive way at all. Uh, with the rooms, I, I brought them back a lot in level. One thing which I did is I favored the room mono mic, which up till now had basically been, well, had been muted. Um, 
it being mono kind of changes the texture a little bit because you know it's not like the drums are exploding off to the sides all the time it kind of keeps them more pinned down the middle of the mix and I thought that would be a, a cool vibe it's there's not very much room in there in general for this section but I thought that having a bit more of a mono room would be cool right as this section ends you've got a big old drum fill that takes you into the chorus and what I did there actually was a little bit of the opposite I've boosted up the volume of the rooms just for the duration of the fill and I've also given the actual drum bus a bit of a boost, about a dB in a bit, that lasts just into the beginning of the next section so you get a really loud downbeat into that part too. So um, I'll play just you know from four bars away from the end of the verse. So you'll hear the kind of soft and more intimate vibe of the drums at this point, um, as well as the really huge sounding fill going into the next section. And I'm also gonna mute the vocal submix here so you just listen to the instrumental. So hopefully you get the idea. I'll actually do the same thing with the drums soloed and you'll get, I think, more of an impression of just how it goes from a kind of much tighter and intimate feel to a very huge feel as the, uh, as the snare fill comes in. So automation like this for me is a crucial part of getting sections to flow from one to another really well, as well as maintaining um, a good sound because like we've just been talking about, having the room mics cranked in the chorus, for example, sounds great, but would probably be a bit too much in the verse. And while a listener isn't going to notice um, the automation moves that you made necessarily, you know, they, they can be subtle, they can be a lot more subtle than the ones which I've been making here. Um, they might well take them out of the moment if you didn't make those moves because you might find that the verse just sounds way too overbearing where it should be something a lot more intimate and subtle. So uh, definitely don't overlook automation. Once I've got my, my mix up on one section of the song, I'll do quite a few passes of the song just making um, moves from section to section to try, if anything, to maintain a vibe rather than to change it. And I think, um, I think that's one of the, the biggest parts of getting songs to actually sound complete as far as I'm concerned. Thanks for watching and we really hope this has been informative and perhaps might even inspire a little bit of your creative process moving forwards. But in the meantime, for more information, head over to getgooddrums.com.